The stars that are embroidered into the tapestry of the night sky have guided Māori people since the beginning of time. These stars enabled Māori to traverse the greatest expanse of ocean on the planet to arrive here in Aotearoa. It also guided their day-to-day -day activities by combining the rising and setting of stars with the lunar phases and the position of the sun, Māori were able to sync their lifestyles to the natural rhythms of the environment and understand that this environment would dictate to them when they could plant and harvest, when they could hunt and fish, when they could interact, and when they needed to spend time in isolation planning and preparing for another season. This knowledge existed within every tribal group and drove our activities every day, every month, every season, and from year to year, from winter to summer, and back again to winter. So this program is about us exploring the depth of knowledge that pertains to Māori astronomy, and in particular, Matariki. It is a journey that goes beyond what we know, it goes beyond what we have experienced, and it goes beyond Matariki. In the last episode, we launched our Māori year by observing the rise of Matariki in the morning sky just before the sun. This new year begins in midwinter, and it follows the activities and events that our ancestors undertook during this cold and bitter time. In this new episode, we'll be looking at how the seasons change from winter to spring and what Māori did during this period to sync the year with the Matariki calendar and follow the natural cycles of the environment. So during the cold months of winter, the sun rises with Hine Takuru, his winter maiden. However, as we move into Mahuru, and as we move into Whiringa Nuku and Whiringa Rangi, the sun leaves Hine Takuru and begins his journey back to his summer wife, back towards the east and then towards the southeast. And this is the sun turning and leaving Hine Takuru on this journey to bring warmth, and to bring vitality, and to bring life back to the earth. There are three months in the Kuanga season, or the spring season. They are Mahuru, Whiringa Anuku, and Whiringa Arangi. All of these months and their names are stars. Mahuru is the month that you really notice the environment and the earth actually coming back to life. It is when we see the first fruits or the first flowerings of the major trees. It's when we notice that the animals start to become more active, that they are giving birth, birds are starting to lay their eggs, and it's this whole revitalization of the environment, which then moves into the following two months. Whiringa anuku. Whiringa means the heat, and it's when the warmth and the, the heat begin to come back to the soil of the earth, and the earth actually begins to warm up. And Whiringa Arangi is the heat in the atmosphere, and we notice that the air begins to warm, the sun rises earlier, the days begin to lengthen, the nights become a little bit shorter, and we see this whole return of life, activity, and vitality back to the earth. Mahuru. Whiringa Anuku and Whiringa Arangi are stars, and they rise in the morning before the sun comes up as a marker of month. But there are also other stars that indicate these months. One is Kōpū, and the fifth month, also known as Whiringa Anuku, is also called Teri Mao Kōpū. The sixth month is also known as Whitia Nono, which is also a star. And this is a very important star in terms of our spirituality. Because Fitiā Nōnō is the place 
where hine tītama crossed from the world of the living into the world of the dead and became hine nui te pō. So it's a transitional point. It's a changing phase, like the season comes out of winter and moves into spring. Whiti a no no is a crossing point, and in terms of Māori spirituality, it is the place where hine nui te pō crossed over from the world of the light into darkness in order to prepare herself to welcome and care for the dead who pass during the year. Koanga is the changing of the seasons. Koanga is a shift from the cold, frigid, freezing days and nights where the earth has pretty much shut down, where the gardens are no longer active, into this period where life begins to find its way back to the earth. The sun is moving back towards the east. It's coming closer to us. So koanga is that period where we notice an actual shift. It is a period of celebration in terms of celebrating life and new life. It is where we see the birds start to become active again. We see the ground begin to warm and the new shoots of life coming out of the earth. And it was a period of time where these new shoots were collected by our ancestors in a ceremony known as Te Mato Te Tau. Te Mato Te Tau is taking the mata, or the new fresh shoots of the growth that comes out of the earth, and they would be collected up, and they would be burnt and placed on an altar. And karakia and prayers would be conducted to the various stars in the sky, including Matariki, including Atutahi, and all of these stars to ensure that life would come back to the earth. And they would chant in karakia, Matariki atua ka eke ki te rangi e rō nei ye, whangai ei hoki te mato te tau e rō nei ye. So Matariki, great star in the sky, feast upon the new fruits of the year and bring life back to the earth. And they would name the different stars, connected to the different produce, connected to the different activities, connected to hunting and fishing and gardening, and offer these new shoots to them in order to ensure the harvest and the bounty of a new year. In the winter months, there are a number of stars that rise and are connected to different aspects and activities during winter. And one of them is Wero i Te Whakataka Pungarehu. Now, when that star is seen in the winter, it is a sign for people to gather up their pungarehu, which are the ashes from their fires, and actually dump them on the gardens that are no longer in use. And it's a form of fertilising the soil in preparation for spring. Whakataka Pungarehu means to lay out or dump the embers or the ash on top of the gardens and to turn them into the soil. Apart from that, there was no activities within the gardens, which was such a crucial and arguably the most significant and major part of traditional Māori society was gardening. Then in spring, our ancestors returned to the gardens and they would begin tilling the soil. They would begin turning the ash into the soil in preparation for planting. Now there are a number of signs that will determine when and where Māori would plant. Gardening was very, very susceptible to environmental change. And one of the things that was feared more than anything else was frost. And so when they would look at the signs, they'd make sure that the season and the period of frost had passed. If it hadn't, and they had planted their gardens, the new growths or the new shoots would be killed. And they would see a star and they knew frost is on the way. And they would run into the gardens and dance and chant. Ka tahiti, ka ruati, ka haro mai te pati tore karau na, karau na. No ho te ki wi ki wi he po he wai taki taki no pi no pa kai ana te fetu kai ana te marama hoki atu te tio ki rungara. So it's asking for the frost to go back and be eaten by the stars and the moon. 
gardens was so, so crucial to the survival of Māori, and it was ingrained and embedded into our activities, particularly in the spring and then in the autumn. And it's connected to a number of birds, in particular the pipifarauroa, or the shining cuckoo, and the kwekwea, the long-tailed cuckoo. Both of these birds spend our winter in our various parts of the Pacific. That's where they go and they spend our winter in these warmer climates. Then around Mahuru, they come back. They come back right on the period where Māori begin to plant the kumara. The kumara was a staple in traditional Māori society. The kumara and the taro. But these two birds are often referred to as the kumara birds. When they come back, they begin to call. In particular, the pipifarauroa, the shining cuckoo calls, kui kui fiti fiti ora. Means I call, I call, I have crossed safely. Crossed over from the Pacific Islands here to Aotearoa to lay their eggs. Now this is a sign when that call is heard that Māori begin to plant their gardens. And if you aren't planting your gardens and you aren't active, people would say to you, I hea koe i te tangi a te pipifarauroa. Where were you when the pipifarauroa was calling? That's a saying from our people, letting others know that it is a time of activity, it is a time to get into the gardens, to start preparing the gardens and start planting the gardens. The kuaka, which migrates right across to Siberia, returns back to Aotearoa uh, to certain coastal areas. Our birds begin to lay their eggs in our fresh water, in our rivers. The glass eels uh, come back along with the inanga. The kokopu is fat and was caught during this period, along with the keawai, or the kouru. So the freshwater crayfish was in its best condition during this spring period. And there is another group of stars called Kewai, just like there is a group of stars called Pipifarauroa, there's a group of stars called Kwekwea, there is a group of stars connected to the gardens and to all of the activities, and when they rise and are prominent in the sky, Māori knew it was time to partake in a particular event or start a particular activity. So it was a period where life that had left us actually begins to return with the sun and this life comes back to us from other parts of the world. Māori knew that these birds went missing for six months of the year and then in Mahuru they came back and it was another important sign of new growth and new life. The Māori calendar system takes into account a number of factors. First and foremost, you look towards the sun. Now the rising and setting of the sun gives you season. When the sun is rising with Hine Takurua, you're in winter. When the sun is rising with Hine Raumati, you're in summer. And the position of the sun as it rises and sets gives you your general indication of what season you're in. Now when stars rise, just before the sun, what's called heliacal stars, when they're in position in the sky, just as the sun is rising, that gives you month. It also gives you activity, like when you should garden. A particular star is in the shape of a spade. It's telling you it's time to get out there and turn your soil over. However, that activity didn't take place until you were in the correct lunar phase. Lunar phase, or the maramataka, that change throughout the month, give you activity and day. So sun gives you season, stars give you month and activity, and the moon gives you the actual day that you should be doing that activity. And so the position of the stars are measured in correlation with the position of the sun. So the stars that rise as the sun is rising were noted, as were the stars that are setting as the sun rises are noted, as are the stars that are directly above your head when the sun is rising. Now when the sun is setting, there are stars that are rising in the east as well, 
There are stars that are setting in the west and there are stars that are directly above your head. And as the stars rise four minutes earlier every day, the stars we see in the morning sky in the winter are different to the stars we see in the morning sky in the summer. All of these indicators, all of these stars, the position of the sun, and even the lunar phases, all hinged and were underpinned by Matariki, which was viewed in that early morning sky in the middle of winter in the correct lunar month of the correct lunar phase, laid out the entire cycle for the whole year. Some of the important activities that occur around this time and are associated with kuanga and stars that rise. One group of stars is called kewe, freshwater crayfish. The star rises in the morning with the sun in the spring months and is a sign that that is when the koura is in its best condition and should be harvested and taken. Glass eels or the alva or the young from the eels that have gone to spawn in the ocean return to the waterways and to the rivers and to the lakes around this time and begin their migration upstream. It is also around this period that the inanga or white bait is seen in our rivers returning upstream and during the spring months and later into the spring, the kokopu were taken in large numbers when they were fat. One particular food source that is no longer eaten by Māori is the tikoka, or the cabbage tree. It is a food source that's no longer eaten by the vast majority of Māori. During the fifth month, Firinganuku, or kōpū, the trunk of the tikoka was cut and it was steamed in massive earth ovens and it was cooked over days. And when it was fully cooked, was taken out of these ovens and our ancestors would beat it and it would form a molasses, a very sweet kind of substance that they would eat to flavour meat, in particular meat that was really fatty. And so it was a staple in some areas, particular colder areas that couldn't grow kumara. The tikoka or the cabbage tree and its trunk was steamed and eaten. Now when the constellation that is tikoka rises in the morning before the sun. During the fifth month, our ancestors knew it was time to harvest this tree and to begin cooking it, preparing it and putting it in the food storehouses and they would eat it throughout the year as they caught fish, as they hunted birds and as they ate meat. It was a very important food source and is directly associated with the activities of spring. Māori have always been gardeners and we have always gardened and we continue to maintain gardens. Perhaps not to the same extent that our ancestors did with these massive communal gardens and they were giant. They were rows upon rows of kumara, of taro, of this industry that was associated with the events of spring. Also interesting to note that as we have westernised our way of thinking and behaving, that as we get into these warmer months, we actually start to go on holiday. From a Western perspective, it's time to go to the beach, it's time to relax, it's time to celebrate and spend time in the sun. But for Māori, it was the complete reverse. The winter months were the times where you relaxed, when there was no activity to happen. That's when you downed tools, and that's when you didn't expend a lot of energy and you were in a more sedate, relaxed kind of mode. But as things start to warm up, that's actually when the work began. And for Māori, they were constantly working during these warmer months, particularly into spring and particularly into summer. And so, as the weather gets warmer, our activity increases. As the world starts to rejuvenate itself and life comes back to the earth and everything in the world, Māori were the same. We sink our lifestyles and our actions into what was happening in the environment and life came back to us as people. The practices of our ancestors still exist in some small pockets and there are groups that are maintaining traditional gardens, 
and are focusing on gardens and focusing on harvesting and focusing on changing environmental phases. But for the most part, we all live very westernised lifestyles where we really rely on other people to feed us. We don't plant, harvest and fish like we used to. If we are hunting now, we do it in pack and save and countdown because that's our garden. We rely on other people to feed us. And so this knowledge has really started to disappear from the mainstream Māori world. And it is something that is really important for us to maintain and hold on to because food sovereignty and the ability to feed ourselves will be a crucial element in our survival going forward. In order to practice this knowledge base, the most important thing you have to do is to get out into the environment and to observe. Actually take note of what is happening around you. Take note of when trees are flowering during this time. Take note of what is happening to birds. Take note of what insects are starting to make noises and starting to move around. Our ancestors would take detailed observations of different things happening in the environment and they would name them and they would know that they would be symbolic or be a sign of something that was going to happen in the summer months. For instance, a great sign was to have trees, flower and fruit from the bottom to the top. This is called a taururu and it happens around spring. And around the fifth month and into the sixth month, when the first trees are starting to bloom and flower, and if they begin to bloom and flower at the bottom and start heading towards the top of the tree, it was a sign that nutrients were coming out of the bottom of the earth and flowering from the bottom upwards, and it was going to be a very productive year. However, if these trees began to fruit and flower from the top down, it wasn't going to be a very good year because there was a lack of nutrients and they were shooting straight to the top of the tree and making the top of the tree flower and fruit first before coming down if there was any leftover nutrients to really give bloom and fruits to the bottom half of the tree. And this is a sign that it was going to be a smaller harvest that year because it was a different pattern to the flowering of the trees. And the only way that they knew this was by going out during the spring and kuanga and observing what was happening in the environment. So in order to connect to this space, it's about observation, it's about taking note, it's about being connected to the details in the environment and then making it part of your day-to-day -day life. Kuanga or spring is a period of time where there is a definite change in the environment. The sun is making its return back to the earth, bringing with it new life, new growth. Birds are starting to return from overseas. Plants are starting to flower. There is an atmosphere of warming, growing, flowering and fruiting. People are coming out of a period of inactivity and near on hibernation from eating the food that they'd stored from last year's harvest, sitting together, planning for the year, viewing Matariki, and getting ready in preparation for the most active time of the year, which is summer. So what people were doing during the spring and kuanga period is taking detailed observations of their localised environment, whether that be on the coast, whether that be inland, whether that be in mountainous terrain or along great flats, whether it be in the bottom of the south where the climate was a lot more temperate, or whether it would be in the far north where it was subtropical. They were out in their own environments making detailed observations of what was happening around them, instilling that within their own localised calendar systems of time, and their own localised practices, their own localised ceremonies, their own localised activities as we move into the most active and productive time of the year, which is no mati or the summer. Oh, man.
quietude.